In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. When our Lord Jesus Christ uh, took flesh and entered into human history, he declared himself and showed himself primarily, though not exclusively, as the lover of mankind, and declared the Father as such as well. So important is this aspect of God's relation to man, that he is the lover of man, that the title, lover of mankind, Pima Romi, Philanthropos, is something that is always embedded in our prayers of the church. So whenever you hear Abuna praying litanies for those who have departed, or those who are sick, or those who are traveling, he addresses God as God, the Father, the Pantocrator. We ask and entreat your goodness, O lover of mankind. Because it's not just a quality of character, the way that a human being can be sometimes loving and sometimes not loving. It is essential to God's being that he is love. That's why we say God is love. And the church has been meditating on this theme this first month of the Coptic year, on God's immense love for mankind and his acceptance of everyone, saints and sinners. Last week, we meditated upon the repentance of Zacchaeus, the tax collector, and how he changed course and recentered his life when Christ entered into his. And this week, we meditate upon a very iconic gospel uh, for the theme of repentance. And that is the repentance of the sinful woman, the woman who came uh, weeping and pouring fragrant oil on the feet of Christ. And it, ever since, it became a very well-known icon of repentance, upon which many fathers have meditated, and it became such an important aspect of Christian life, the life of repentance, that it was enshrined in the prayers of the church, not only in the lectionary, when it comes up uh, in certain readings, but it's in the midnight prayer of the Agbeya, this gospel that we just prayed. It's in the midnight office of the Agbeya because it is at that time of midnight in which man is supposed to return to himself and re-examine his actions and offer repentance for them. So the church brings this gospel to our attention not just once or twice a year, but every night if we were to follow the rule of prayer of the church and pray the midnight prayers of the church. Repentance, you see, is often misunderstood as sadness. You get this image of the person who was uh, engulfed in, in depression almost. But repentance in the Orthodox understanding is this joyful response to God's love. God loves me and therefore I will offer to him myself. God loves me and therefore I will make sure that I continuously realign my life to be in accordance to his will and to be according to his good pleasure. And that is what repentance is. And so as we conclude this Coptic month of Tut in which every gospel was a proclamation of God's love for mankind and his coming in the flesh and the spreading of the gospel, we conclude on this theme that man's proper response to this love is repentance. And repentance is best exemplified in this story of the sinful woman. The story begins with a different character, and that is the Pharisee who asked Christ to go eat with him, invited him over to his house. And it may raise some questions because we are used to the Pharisees being antagonistic to Christ, almost sitting always on the sidelines, criticizing him, criticizing his actions, and criticizing him for especially for eating, drinking with sinners. But this was relatively early in the Gospel of Luke and in the ministry of Christ in Galilee. And in fact, this passage comes right after the Gospel that we read on the first Sunday of Tut, in which Christ speaks about St. John the Baptist. And so early on, the Pharisees had a certain curiosity about Christ. 
And this one of the Pharisees also had a certain curiosity and wanted to invite this new preacher to find more about him, to learn more about him. He wasn't sure who that is. There may have been other reasons as well. You know, if a popular preacher uh, gaining popularity day after day, it may give this Pharisee who invited him himself a certain social standing and prestige for inviting over this famous preacher to his house, knowing, of course, that it will also attract a number of people with him. It may have been to uh, show off his own riches, that he's capable of holding such a feast for an important personality. We don't know exactly what was in the mind of this Pharisee, but he invited Christ to eat with him, and Christ, just as he eats with sinners, tax collectors, and so forth, answered the call, answered the invitation, and went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. But Christ didn't come just for the righteous. He said, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners unto repentance. And so it's not for those who think of themselves as fully satisfied, as fully content with their standing before God, for whom God comes. It is for those who, first of all, recognize their weakness and acknowledge it. You want a personal relationship with Christ? You want to feel truly that you are his son or daughter? You have to acknowledge, first of all, that you are lacking and that you are standing in dire need of something. And that something is God and his love. And so we move on here to the, to the woman that came in that exemplified this need, this urgent desire to approach Christ and to approach him correctly with the attitude of repentance and not the attitude of self-righteousness, of being too confident in one's purity or in one's holiness, as we will see in the case of the Pharisee. The woman came in and did two primary things. She wept. She began to wash Christ's feet with her tears and to wipe the feet with the hair of her head. Tears are central in the Orthodox experience of repentance. And in scripture, many of the saints wept because of their sinful actions. We hear, for example, of uh, the king and prophet David in the Old Testament weeping bitterly after he came to realize the, the gravity of his sin. If you don't remember, he, he lusted after a woman and orchestrated the, the murder of her husband who was in the army in order to hide the fact that he had fathered a child with that woman. And when he came to realize what that is, he wept bitterly. The Apostle Peter as well is a famous example, and a central example for us for repentance. And he's always contrasted with the, the futile regret of Judas that I can't call repentance, for he went and hung himself despairing uh, in Christ's uh, salvation and redemption. But you have seen Peter on the other hand, who denied Christ three times and wept bitterly, it says and repented fully. And you see this, of course, when Christ accepts him later on and tells him, feed my sheep. You've denied me, but feed my sheep because you've repented and I forget all your sins. And so, so central to the experience of Orthodox repentance is holy tears, as we often call them, that the authors of the Agbeya, our book of prayers, and it's, it's only one of two officially authorized books of prayers of the church. There may be many books of prayers out there uh, of, of pious attempts to collect prayers for various purposes, but the only two books that have withstood the test of time and can be truly called traditional are the Agbeya and the Psalmodeya. And in the Agbeya, you find that the authors of the prayers commenting on this gospel passage in the midnight prayer, begin their entreaty by one thing, grant me, O Lord, a fountain of many tears, 
they didn't begin by saying, grant me, O Lord, a feeling of remorse, or grant me, O Lord, to regret my deeds, or something of a lighter character, something mild and reserved. They went straight to the goal, grant me, O Lord, a fountain of many tears, that I may offer it true repentance. And so tears are intricately intertwined in our tradition with a true repentance. But St. John Chrysostom in his commentary on this passage gives us a fair warning that must be shared and that that is the only thing worse than never crying over one's sins is to cry in a show of, in, 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 a, in a sort of show of piety, falsely. And that too exists uh, in man's weakness, that sometimes tears are not sincere and are only displayed as such in order for others to, to perceive that one is holy. And so St. John Chrysostom is very clear on this and says, Grant us, O Lord, tears, but not the tears of falseness, not the tears of pretense, authentic tears, not the ones that others will see, not in the church, not in the, not in the, in the company of others, but in the loneliness, in the solitude, rather, uh, of one's prayer life. The other thing that this woman did, which is also of great importance, is that she brought uh, what, is, what is called an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping. She anointed his feet with the fragrant oil. Fragrance also is an important and uh, enduring metaphor of holiness and divine presence in the history of the church. We have to remember that, first and foremost, the best smelling sacrifice, the best smelling fragrance for God the Father is Christ himself. In the ancient world, even before the church, and even before Judaism, incense, good smelling substances that were burned, often signified divine presence. In fact, even in late antiquity, Byzantine emperors, when they went in procession into various cities, um, they had acolytes or servants follow them, and they would often swing censers in their presence. Whether or not that implied a certain uh, uh, level of divinity that the emperor was perceived as such, but simply for the fact that an important personality was present, were, was often signified and represented by the act of offering incense. But Jesus Christ is, as it says, the sweet-smelling incense that God the Father smelled upon the cross. And we, again, enshrine this in our hymns. Many of our hymns meditate upon this theme of Christ as the incense. And whenever the priest offers incense in the censer in our liturgical services, you hear the, the chanter singing, Taishori Noob, this pure golden censer carrying the fragrances, it fai hapi aromata. And then the, the, another hymn says, the censer is the virgin, the incense is our savior. Because of our understanding that, that, that ultimately all of our sacrifices of incense or all of our acts of repentance that are meant to resemble this sweet fragrant oil have as their ultimate model Christ and his sacrifice on the cross. In a third beautiful hymn that, that many deacons love to chant on the Feast of the Cross and, and Great Friday, uh, and it says, He who offered up himself as an acceptable sacrifice upon the cross for our salvation, uh, his father smelled it on Golgotha. His good father smelled him on Golgotha on, in the evening. Because Christ ultimately is that sacrifice that was on the cross and was smelled as a very beautiful, very good smelling incense by God the Father. But besides divine presence, incense also in our tradition has uh, uh, a significance of being our prayers. Every evening service, if you come to Vespers, you find us or you, you will hear us singing Psalm 140. Lord, I have cried unto thee, hear me, attend to the voice of my supplication. Let my prayer be set forth as incense before thee, the lifting up of my hands as an evening sacrifice. 
see, so intertwined into our uh, symbolic language is this idea, this strong sense that incense signifies both God's presence but also our prayers to Him. And so this woman comes in and, and, and embeds herself into this entire complex of symbolic language. She brings into herself with this sweet smelling fragrance, this oil that she brought into God's presence, worthily so. And God, it's, Jesus Christ accepts her and welcomes her into his presence and allows her not just to be in his presence in the room with him, even though she was a sinner, but to touch him for her tears to fall on his feet and for the oil she brought to anoint his feet. The Syriac fathers are uh, very prolific in writing about this story in the, in the Gospels, and especially St. Ephraim the Syrian and a number of other uh, fathers. And they develop an entire narrative that is not included in, in the Gospel account. And it tells of how this woman who was a prostitute decides when she hears that Christ is coming into town and going to Simon's house, and that she decides to change her clothes and instead of wearing beautiful clothes that she used to entice men in her profession, she changes them to the sackcloth of repentance. But then she goes to a seller of fragrance and gives him all the money that she has to purchase this fragrant oil. And the, it, it has this, uh, this dialogue, this uh, fictitious dialogue between the seller of fragrance and the woman. And the, the seller of fragrance knows this woman from town, knows what she does for a living, and is perplexed. Why have you changed your fancy clothes to poor clothes, but now you're coming to exchange the stench of your sin with very expensive perfume? Who does that? Who, who, who puts on poor clothes and then fixates upon what kind of fancy perfume they will have on or purchase? And then we hear the meditation that by doing so, the woman brought to Christ the very medicine by which he will heal her. Because that medicine was her fragrant offering of herself and her tears of repentance. And it's through these tears and through these, this beautiful fragrance that Christ then grants her forgiveness of sins. And she goes away justified while the Pharisee is criticized and condemned in this uh, parable that Christ gives in response. See, the, the Pharisee spoke within himself, it says. He doesn't speak out loud to Christ. He says, this man, if he were a prophet, would have known what kind of woman this is. There's no way that he would be a righteous person as he claims to be, and as he often uh, claims in his preaching, if he's allowing sinners to approach him this closely not even just to be in the room with him, but to touch him. St. Cyril of Alexandria says that in doing so, in his criticism, the Pharisee denied Christ even the position of prophet, because even a prophet would know what person is touching him and what person is interacting with him. A prophet has revelation from God about these things, right? But in criticizing Christ, the Pharisee not even didn't acknowledge that Christ is God, but wouldn't even go as far as to proclaim him as prophet. But you see, Christ's response to him showed him that not only does he know what the Pharisee is thinking without him saying it out loud, but that he knows the hearts of all. Because Christ knew what the Pharisee was thinking, and then he responded to him with the parable of the creditor and the debtors. And so in his response, the Lord is saying, Simon, I, not only do I know what you're thinking about me and your criticism of me, of course I know who this woman is and what her history is like. And so, one of the important lessons for us today is acknowledging our sins before Him. And that there is nowhere to hide from God's knowledge. In the beginning of every liturgy, one of the many prayers that the, the priest, the celebrant himself, prays before approaching the service at the altar, a prayer begins by saying, O Lord, who knows the hearts of all, 
And it's, uh, the entire prayer is what is called an apology, meaning that it's an acknowledgement on our part as servants that we are impure, that on our own, we are not worthy to approach the holy altar. And that on our own, nothing that happens here can be called sacramental or mystical. But that because of God's mercy, and even though he knows our hearts as servants, that they cannot, cannot be as pure as they ought to be, he will grant us mercy and he will use us, we, the weak tools in his hands, to effect salvation and to extend himself to the people in the church. And so the lesson for us, whether as servants or as anybody, is that there's nowhere to hide from God. God knows what we're thinking. God knows what we have done. God knows what we do now and what we intend to do. And so when we go to confession, there's no reason to be embarrassed because you're only in the presence of God. And as for the priest who is there, he has committed just as many sins as you have. But God already knows what you have done. And you are simply coming to acknowledge these sins before him, not to reveal something that God does not already know. And so a big part of this gospel today is about this contrast between self-righteousness and a transparent and pure acknowledgement of one's sins. The Pharisee, convinced of his own righteousness because he is a follower of the law, he is a student of the law, and uh, applying ruthlessly these ritual distinctions and demarcations between what is pure and what is profane, and, and using that as a measure of judgment to say that this preacher here is not pure. He's allowing sin to touch him. This on the one hand, and then Christ's acceptance of the sinner completely. But why? Because she offered a pure repentance. You see, this unconditional love that Christ has for us is truly unconditional, but it only becomes effective in our lives when we respond accordingly with repentance. And you see this woman here, uh, Christ said that she, her faith has saved her, but what faith? She didn't utter a word in the whole account. She didn't say, I believe in you, O Christ, or anything of that sort. Her faith was manifested in her works. And so she gave not a well-reasoned apology for the Christian faith, not a confession of faith in a liturgical sort of sense, but she gave a confession through her actions. And not just that, she then foreshadowed for us a number of the church's mysteries that we participate in and receive until this very day. And so when she comes and weeps over Christ, that was her baptism. And that is her, also her second baptism, her confession of sins. When she anoints his feet, that reminds us of chrismation, that seals one's repentance. Even the foot washing is something that we still do to this day. And all of it is contained in this focused symbol of repentance, this icon of repentance that we have before us today that foreshadows for us a number of the church's mysteries. And so today Christ calls us to repentance again. Says to us, yes, we have focused this whole month on Christ's love for mankind and his proclamation of that good news and even Christ's rejoicing in the fact that people were repenting and that evil spirits were being cast out. But that the counterbalance to this love, to this unconditional love, is our response of repentance. You see, here in the parable, the point of the parable, Christ says that he who has been forgiven much, loves much. And it almost comes across as this sequence. The person who was indebted was forgiven, and therefore he loves the, the, the generous creditor more than the person who has been forgiven less. But you see in this story, the woman seems to be doing the opposite because she begins by loving Christ and then receives that forgiveness. She begins by offering herself, not knowing what's going to happen in her encounter with Christ, not knowing if he is the kind of preacher that will in fact reject her for being impure or accept her and accept her repentance. And so we too, we must rejoice in God's acceptance of us, but not be too confident and not be too self-righteous in our relationship with him. Being always cognizant of the fact that we indeed deserve to be rejected, but that in God's love, he accepts all sinners 
uh, if they offer a pure repentance. May God grant us all a pure repentance before him and may he give us to be living in that love that he grants us all, uh, not just this month, but throughout our lives. And glory be to our God now and ever and unto the ages of ages. Amen.